Let's look at some of the earliest medieval breastplates. Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So this is a medieval armor video. Now, many of you will be familiar with the term breastplate. You think you know what that means. You probably do. It means a plate of metal. Usually it could be another material protecting the chest. Now, first thing to say is obviously plates to protect the chest have been around since ancient times. So in ancient Greece, they had bronze breastplates. We've got muscle cuirasses in the Roman era for, um, for officers. And there's various other, for, even if we look at other parts of the world, if we go to Persia or India or other places, we find things which are roughly analogous to breastplates. But in the medieval period, what I'm wearing here, the male shirt, was pretty much the standard form of armour, certainly in uh, Western Europe, for most of the early medieval period, up until, let's call it, the Norman era, okay? Uh, and in fact, beyond that, into the First the Second Crusade, predominantly, people relied for their body defences on mail, commonly known as chain mail. Now, admittedly, if you go east, we start to find things like lamella and forms of scalar armor as well. In fact, scale armor was around obviously in the Roman era also. So there were other things apart from just mail or chain mail. But as we get into the medieval period, as we get into the 13th century, we start to see forms of body defense where they clearly found by this point due to numerous reasons, we can maybe debate this in a future video, but I won't go down that tangent now. For numerous reasons, they decided to start armoring the torso to a higher degree. But this wasn't the first time in Western Europe that they started armoring the torso to a slightly higher degree and the first mentions of breastplates. In fact, if we actually go back into the late 1100s, so kind of Richard III's reign, we do find some isolated mentions to both breastplates of iron. In fact, there's one uh, mention in relation to Richard III's um, kind of armory, and it seems to be associated with jousting equipment and we'll come back to that in a second. And additionally, there are also the earliest mentions of cuirass. Now, cuirass or cuirass, I've talked about this word before. Cuir is French for leather. Okay, so this gives us a hint that perhaps some of the earliest breastplates might not have been metal, medieval Western European breastplates, that is, might not have been metal at all, but might have been leather. But that's probably a topic all for itself. As we get into the 13th century, you find the development of something called the coat of plates. Now, what is the coat of plates? If you don't know already, it's essentially the ancestor of this, okay? So this is a brigandine, and you've seen this in numerous videos of mine. Uh, if I was doing 15th century um, impression or reenactment, I could shove this over this male shirt that I'm wearing, and that would be a very typical 15th century combo, a brigandine with over a male shirt, and sometimes worn by itself with no male shirt underneath. Great form of armor. But the ancestor of this was the coat of plates. In other words, fabric, canvas, sometimes leather on the outside, and plates on the inside. So as we go into the 13th century, for numerous reasons that could be debated, and in fact, I did my degree dissertation kind of looking into this many, many moons ago, 25 years ago, um, the coat of plates was developed in the 1200s, okay? So we start to see plates being added under a fabric or leather garment and worn over the top of mail. And this obviously provides a lot more protection against arrows, crossbows, crossbow bolts, uh, lances, and obviously hand weapons as well. And in turn, it has an effect on the uh, weapons that are being used to overcome armored opponents. You know, if they're more heavily armored, you need to look at perhaps more powerful types of lance being used, more t powerful types of arrow and crossbow bolt being shot by crossbows and longbows. Um, and hand weapons develop as well as you start to, you can't just stab straight at the middle of someone's uh, torso and ha have any chance of going through. You have to go for gaps and therefore you probably develop more, or do, do develop more pointy types of sword and dagger and so on. Okay, so that's again another major topic which we have covered in previous videos and I'm sure we'll revisit again soon. But fundamentally, you've now got the coat of plates. Now, the big difference between the coat of plates and the brigandine, uh, generally speaking, is the coat of plates is simpler. It has larger and fewer plates, okay? So you're talking about less, much, much less plates than a later brigandine and larger plates. Now, this does cover the torso 
down to around the groin or waist, okay? So fundamentally, you've got something which is protecting the torso, um, front and back usually, although predominantly the front, and there are certain types of early coat of plate that appear around 1250, which seem to protect the front, but they kind of lap around the side a bit, but they don't necessarily provide full protection at the back. And these are very popular in modern Bohurt, for example, where 14th century armour is the most uh, replicated type of armour. So we're talking now about the 1300s. And as we go into the 1300s, indeed, the coat of plates is the predominant type of torso armour worn over a male shirt to augment a male shirt. OK, so um, it's a number of plates and they're arranged in different ways and they're not all the same. Some of them have plates horizontally, some have plates vertically. They're very often you have some vertical plates, some horizontal plates, and there's all different arrangements. Now, one of the greatest sources we have for the coat of plates is from the Battle of Visby in 1361, published in 1939 by Bengt Thordeman in two big volumes. And in the battle in 1361, lots of people were uh, killed and thrown into mass graves and their bodies weren't stripped of all their equipment. So lots of armour went into the graves as well. And a lot of that armour is coat of plates. In fact, pretty much all of the armour is coat of plates and sort of lamella. Um, and they're all different. No, what, no two coats of plates are the same. They are all different arrangements of horizontal and uh, horizontal and vertical plates in different placements, in different sizes and arrangements. And in fact, we also have a couple of examples from a place called Kusnak in Switzerland as well uh, that were discovered in a castle ruin. Um, and there's various others also. And they're all different. So there was no one strict formula for the size of plates, shape of plates, how you arrange them and what coverage they gave. But the coat of plates as a generic thing was the main form of torso protection in the 14th century. But what you often notice if you look at 14th century art is you often notice that the top part of the breast as we go into the second half of the 14th century, so after 1350, you start to see the top part of the breast has a slightly more globular and sometimes people describe it as pigeon chested shape. Okay, if we look at, for example, the Black Prince's effigy, which although he died, I think, in 1376, it probably dates to the 1380s, about 10 years later. Uh, he has this shape. His upper breast is quite globular. And this is very, very typical of the time. So in the late 1300s, it's very typical. So what's going on? Well, a couple of things. Firstly, the early 14th century coat of plates seems to have been quite flat chested. But by the time we get into the late 14th century, there were types of coat of plates, sometimes known as corazina, uh, which involve a larger plate up here, which is uh, can, uh, essentially with the coat of plates, but underneath there is a one singular larger plate or sometimes a pair of plates, and this is a term we see mentioned in the sources, which together give a globular upper chest. Okay, but is this really a breastplate? Not exactly. However, we do have mentions of breastplates. So I'm just going to pull a book up here. So this is pretty much one of the Bibles. Uh, this is European Armour by Claude Blair. This is the first edition I've got. I have actually got a couple of these. Um, and he gives some early, early mentions of breastplates being separate from um, from coats of plates. So we've got obviously references to coats of plates in the late 12, or certainly artistically in the late 1200s, second half of the 1200s, and we've got written references to them in the 1300s, loads, and they're, they're often just referred to in the inventories as plates or pairs of plates. But uh, what we start to see from about the 1330s, 1340s are references, for example, here, poitrine uh, pour les justes, um, so poitrines for the joust. And then in 1361, a, a brust plate pour juste, so a breastplate for joust, um, and a pectoral and other terms, which are clearly describing a distinct and separate breastplate. So here we have it. So 1330s, 1340s. And then um, uh, uh, Claude Blair goes on to give various examples uh, of effigies and uh, from the 1340s through to the 1370s, which essentially show separate plates. And in fact, by the time we get to the 1380s, 1390s, particularly in Germany, it's really common to see a separate plate worn up here. OK, so fundamentally, the earliest mainstream, and let's ignore the isolated examples like the, the record from Richard III's time, which probably incidentally was also a jousting breastplate, as I mentioned before. 
when we get into the 1340s, 50s, 60s, we start to see, and so this is around the time of the Battle of Crecy, the Battle of Poitiers, in addition to mentions of coat of plates, we also see references to separate, independent breastplates. So what did these look like? How did they work? Well, luckily, we have uh, effigies to look at, and we can see some examples in effigies. Sometimes they have a medial ridge. They've got a globose or rounded structure. Sometimes they have vertical fluting. Um, but we also have some surviving examples. And I have a replica of one of those surviving examples here. So one of the most amazing armories that has survived is Kerberg, spelt Cherberg, um, armory in, uh, in the Tyrol. And there is an amazing collection of armor there from one family, okay, and the Trap family. And they, the armor spans from the 14th century right the way through the 15th century. So, uh, and all different armors made for different individuals was collected there and preserved there. And this is made by Artos Munitorum, who have um, given it to me for the purposes of videos. So thank you very much. I will stick a link straight below to Artos Munitorum. And this is a replica of one of the two early, circa 1400 probably, 1390, 1400 I'd say, um, breastplates that are in the Kerberg arsenal. So let's get this on. So there we have it. This is an example of a circa 1400 isolated separate breastplate um, or putrine as one of those sources calls it um, and you can see it's got a very globo shape now if you look at um, most of the effigies of this period between 1380 all the way through to about 1410 so the kind of pre-Agincourt period so um, you'll notice that this is the shape that most of those effigies have and that's the reason now this does echo the shape that we also find on civilian clothing on the doublets this was a shape that they thought was pleasing but i think there's more to it than that and it's a two-way exchange isn't it is is it that the posh civilian clothing adopted that shape because that was the shape that knights started to look like in their armor or is it that the armour adopted that shape because that was the shape that fashionable doublets were? I don't think that we can necessarily say that it's a one directional exchange. I think it was part and parcel of the same thing. And there's no question that this type of globose shape has a number of benefits as a breastplate. Now, just before I go into those benefits, I want to point out and remind you again that some of the earliest references to separate breastplates are within the context of jousting and I don't think we should overlook that even if we go back to the earliest references isolated references um, in the 1100s then again jousting is probably key here so very clearly if you are jousting down the list against someone it adds advantageous to wear a certain type of helmet and a certain type of body armor that you at that point you might not necessarily wear in war but it's beneficial within a tournament setting because it gives you a lot more protection but that being said we know that these did end up being worn in war and just as today we see formula one drivers trying out technology that eventually passes down into our cars that we drive around on the streets or you know famous kind of space age technology like your your like your frying pan um, we know that this probably there's some kind of comparison between these kind of extreme sports like jousting or indeed uh, the type of uh, bassinets pioneered for, for certain types of foot combats were sometimes used in war because they were found well it works really well for this maybe we'll use it for this as well so I think this probably also happened anyway regardless of that and that's a matter of opinion on my part um, these globose shapes do have some advantages over the flatter, earlier types of uh, chest defense that we see as part of a coat of plates. And what are those advantages? Well, obviously, you'll all be shouting at your screens at this point that one of the major advantages is deflection, okay? So it doesn't really matter whether it's a lance or a sword or an arrow, crossbow bolt, whatever, coming at you. If you have a rounded shape here, or later on a Castanbrush style shape, but these deflective angles, the thing which hits you is more likely to slide off. And on that note, for any of you who've watched uh, Todd's absolutely incredible Arrows vs. Armour series, which I continue to follow avidly and uh, talk to Todd about behind the scenes and, and gives me ideas for things that I'm doing as well, you will notice I have the beloved stop rib here. Now, these stop ribs first appear, if I remember correctly, in the 1380s or thereabouts. So they're fairly new technology, but you can see that 
it was not necessarily something you need when you have a flatter chest as found on a brigandine or a coated plates because you don't get that deflection upwards from lances, arrows, swords, whatever, when you don't have a globose chest. So it almost becomes these two things come together. Once you've got this slidey chest here and you've got things that are likely to slide off the center, then you also need a stop rib or, as we say later on, you need something like a bever or a bolt down great bassinet or some other solution to prevent things from coming upwards here and under, under your neck. Now, this is particularly important in, in this period because the type of helmet being worn is a bassinet with a male aventail. So the male aventail is sitting down here. So anything sliding up here could theoretically go under the male aventail. If it was coming in from the front, as we saw in Todd's Arrows versus Armour, you've got an Aventail, you've got padding underneath it, and you've got a male collar underneath. So you've got several layers of protection. But coming up from underneath, it would bypass some of those. It would bypass the Aventail. And in fact, we do see some examples where a, um, a surcoat or jupon is being worn, so a fabric garment's being worn over the armour, where we can actually see the Aventail has been tied down to it, presumably to try and prevent some of these things coming up underneath. But nevertheless, when you've got this deflective globo shape, you need a stop rib here, unless you've got some other solution, as I say, like a bolt down helmet. Um, uh, so the replaced, what replaced the Aventel, basically, the great bassinet. So the other advantage, and this is not mentioned an awful lot. And again, we can extrapolate this from Todd's arrows versus armor test, but I've also seen it through personal experience as well. When you have a globe on the front of a, a hemisphere on the front of your body here what you now have is essentially a gap between your body and the armor now that's important for two reasons one is shock absorption so if you're being hit by a lance even if the you know if you're being hit by a coronel hopefully it's not going to penetrate anything but the breastplate it might dent it might push inwards, even if it's um, sort of sprung steel, it could flex inwards, just the same as, you know, bodywork on a car flexes in before it flexes back out again after an impact. So by having that further away from your body, that protects your ribs, your internal organs and everything else from that impact. But moreover, if we're talking about penetration now, if we're in this period, we are not for the most part talking about hardened carbon steel armor. Some armor was, admittedly. Some bassinets have proven to be, but most wasn't. We're fairly sure that the majority of armor in the 1300s was iron. It was unhardened iron. And at best, if it had that tiny percentage of carbon in it, then it was what we would now call mild steel, which is not really hardenable, not by very much anyway. So by and large, this is relatively soft, a bit like Augusto's um, armor that he made for the second Arrows vs. Armor 2. Um, and we have seen that that can be penetrated sometimes. You know, we see a penetration on the arm armor. We saw a penetration, partial penetration um, up on the helmet, I think. And yes, you can get penetration. However, the advantage of this globo structure is firstly, you've got deflection. So a lot of energy is going to be lost. Secondly, you've got a crumple zone. OK, so even if a, uh, an impact forces it in, it's not going to hit your body. But secondly, if you've got penetration, if you look how deep most of the penetrations that Todd has got or I have got even when I did the dagger penetration when I did the collaboration video with Todd, you'll notice that yes we can penetrate plate with a weapon, be it an arrow or a dagger or a warhammer or whatever, but it doesn't penetrate a lot. Now think about the distance here. So having this globe here means that even if I get that much arrow penetrating through my breastplate, which is fairly unlikely, but even if it happens, it's probably not going to reach my internal organs. At worst, it will be a superficial wound rather than if this was resting against my body, it'd be a really serious wound and I would definitely be out of combat for today and I might be on how to combat for the rest of my life. So these globose breastplates are really quite something, uh, you know, impressive. It's an impressive idea. And obviously it was something that was carried on. If we look at 15th century um, two-part breastplates with a placard, which is something which comes later, maybe we'll look at in a future video just by itself, because obviously my other armor has that. Um, even if we go all the way through to the 16th and 17th centuries with uh, breastplates being worn in the time, you know, in the Elizabethan period and the conquistadors and into the English Civil War and all that kind of period, they fundamentally follow this principle of deflective surface, globose or curving, 
and away from the body to some extent, at least down here at the center of body mass to create that deflection crumple zone um, and mean that even if they are penetrated, hopefully it won't reach your body as well. Okay, finally, I want to talk, because I know people are going to ask about this. Matt, what about your groin? Tell us about your groin. So, so yes, absolutely, this doesn't protect the lower abdomen. And this is one of the interesting things. Um, I remember many moons ago, I think probably a teenager, watching a documentary about uh, by Richard Holmes about the Battle of Agincourt. And he put one of these breastplates, in fact, it was the other Kerberg breastplate, the one with laminated, vertically laminated bits around the side but the same overall shape as this. And he put one of these on and pointed out, oh, well, you know, if I was, walk if I was a French knight walking towards the English archers, I'd be mincemeat because their arrows would be going through my mail down here. Well, hold on a second. So a number of things. First of all, you've got to think about the layers that are being worn, okay? So the arming clothes that are worn underneath at this time are not the same as arming doublets that are being worn, thinner arming doublets that are being worn in the 15th century. The likelihood is that the the cloth armour being worn underneath mail and plate in the 1300s is generally, probably, a little bit more layered. Okay, so you've got some protection from that. Secondly, there are certain types of armour that we know for certain were being worn in Germany later on, where they um, have just a big male skirt underneath, where you've actually got kind of almost a corrugated structure and padded structure to the, to the skirt, if you want to call it that, underneath. So there could be various things going on with fabric. Secondly, we've got mail. Now, a lot of people underestimate mail. And can you shoot an arrow through mail? Yes, you can. However, trying to stab through mail is not as easy as you might think. Um, and mail comes in many forms. It comes in many different ring sizes, wire thickness. Um, there's iron and the steel. There's even heat treated. There's hardened steel at uh, mail being mentioned. And there's double layered. So it's entirely possible that you could have what's only visible being mail and fabric down here. But that could be layers. It could be two layers of mail. It could be very small links of mail. It could be hardened mail. And it could have other things underneath it as well, okay, that we can't necessarily see in the artwork. But in addition to that, <laughs> you've got to bear in mind that a lot of the time weapons don't even go through mail. And people have been relying on mail for centuries, okay? So just because they've added this up here, don't necessarily think about this as being really, really weak, because bear in mind, that's what they've been wearing for centuries. That's what all of the Crusades, or the first three Crusades were fought in, was mail, okay? So, so they're just wearing the mail that people have been wearing for centuries, but they're adding this to the upper chest. But there is, of course, a separate skirt that can be worn with this. Now, later on, we get the what we refer to usually as a fold, so um, horizontal lames down here. Initially, they were just at the front, and you'll notice that this is open at the back. Later on, back plates were added. We'll look at those in another video. Um, but you do find additional little skirts that could be worn on here. And a really simple thing, if you just wanted to augment this breastplate with a, with a, uh, a skirt or an apron, essentially, is one made of scales, and we see this in the art. So you can have it, you could have a second layer of mail, or you could have scales, or you could have just a little, what we sometimes see already in the 1380s, a little um, apron, essentially, of overlapping uh, plates. Sometimes they're rectangular, but usually horizontal bands that become later the fold, which is attached to the bottom of the upper thorax or breastplate up here. Um, and they can be worn separately. They don't have to be attached to this. But I have to say already in 1410, uh, it's pretty normal to already see a plate fold on a lot of armors in most parts of Europe. Although it's interestingly in Germany, not necessarily. So the Germans are a little bit different to other people. And the Germans were wearing separate breastplates like this uh, with just visibly anyway, just male down below here, not necessarily with any visible plate. That doesn't mean to say there wasn't plate underneath or scale or layers of male, we don't know. Um, so there we go. Um, I hope that's super um, useful to you if you didn't already know about these. But what a great bit of armour. I imagine you're a guy who in the year, let's say 1380, 1390, uh, has been, you know, relying on just mail with maybe a, a rudimentary coated plate, a so basic like a Visby type coated plate. One of these big breastplates, you literally can't feel impacts from things like lances or arrows on here anymore. It's away from your body, it's deflective, it's a great design. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about deflective armor because I've got some ideas for, th for some things I want to talk about in the future. Anyway, that's basically an introduction to the earliest 
standalone Western European medieval breastplates. Not a new invention, they had breastplates in the ancient world, but these really were where the later cuirasses really come from. This combined with the coat of plates, these two things working together and then harmonizing to create the cuirass that we famously see uh, from 1400 onwards. This is where it started and that's why you get that shape. Thanks a lot again to Artus Munitorum for uh, giving this to me for purposes of the channel. Um, it's a great thing to have, a lot of fun to wear. I'm going to have to put together now uh, late 14th, early 15th century armour, aren't I? <laughs> so there we go. I've got to put together another armour. Any ideas for that or any other questions down below? I hope I'll see you in the comments. Cheers for watching, folks. I have been Matt Easton. I will continue to be. Cheers. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.